So if we turn our attention back to the notion of strategic advantage and knowledge management specifically, we can make the claim that patterns are a tool for achieving both of those objectives. Uh, the pattern itself is an effective way of communicating knowledge and information. And as we evolve or enhance our understandings of individual patterns, of the pattern form, of the pattern language kind of potential, uh, we can start to develop an organizational infrastructure that uses this pattern tool as a means of incorporating tacit knowledge communication process into uh, the organization. The fact that this leads to competitive advantage is the fact that in today's business world, you have to be able to respond very quickly to very rapidly changing circumstances. It means that means you need to have a foundation. You need to have a shared perspective. Uh, you have need to know the way that things have been addressed or dealt with in the past. But you also need the flexibility and the ambiguity to say, well, gee, if I twist this just this little bit of a way, I can come up with a new way of responding to this new circumstance. And organizations that are able to do that, and that are able to do that very quickly, are the organizations that are going to survive and thrive. We first started writing in the business world about this uh, in, in the 70s. Many of you might remember uh, a book uh, called Thriving on Chaos uh, by Peters. Uh, this was one of the very first hi highly popular kinds of books that said that companies have to be rapidly adaptable, flexible, and they need some kind of a foundation, a knowledge foundation upon which to base this. So the fact that the competitive advantage is there is apparent in the business world. The thing that is being added in this presentation is the idea that a pattern can actually be an effective tool for doing that. Looking at some of the ways uh, or the kind of a mechanism or a process for doing this, uh, we turn to a very famous Japanese professor of knowledge management and a model that he and others uh, developed called the SECI model. Socialization, externalization, and combination and internalization is the words that are the foundation or the basis for the acronym. But this model recapitulates some of the things that we have been saying already this morning. Uh, knowledge begins um, within the individual as tacit kind of knowledge, and we seek a means or a way of sharing that knowledge and articulating that knowledge uh, to, to socialize that knowledge, to make it become part of the group, uh, to commit the, uh, the tacit knowledge into shared knowledge. And to do this, we require some kind of externalization. Well, a pattern is an externalization of knowledge. When you sit and write a pattern, you are saying, I have this insight, I have this understanding of a complex domain, and here is how I want to communicate that to you. Here is a means and a mechanism for you to acquire that knowledge yourself. Uh, the knowledge now becomes explicit in this kind of a process, but it's a special kind of explicit. It is not a how-to manual. It is a imagine this situation and this scenario, these kinds of forces, these are ways that you can resolve them and uh, come up with, with a solution. There's still flexibility, there's still uh, ambiguity and the potential for innovation inside of that pattern. Um, it's explicit, however, and we can start to acquire patterns as if they were an asset. So we can start to build a patterns library in our organization. And there are some issues about that that we'll talk about in just a second, but it is now a tangible, visible, external kind of an asset or organization. But then we have to internalize these patterns again. Uh, we have to, each individual in the organization, 
that was not the originator of the pattern has to figure out a way of bringing that pattern back inside of their head, uh, amalgamating it or putting it together with all the other patterns that they have in their heads and making a consistent model. So back at the very beginning, I said that you have to have a model in your head of how the world works and what it's working. A pattern comes along and it's going to either confirm or uh, diminish that model, weaken or strengthen that model. And you're going to make an adjustment and elaborate your theory, and now you have the foundation again for discovering uh, more additional tacit knowledge uh, because of the synthesis and then starting the cycle all over again. There is an implication here that is uh, similar to agile software developers, that this process is a kind of a spiral, that it can go from very specific kinds of tacit knowledge to broader and broader and broader uh, kinds of areas of application, uh, that it is incrementally increasing your store and your advantage of knowledge. So it is this asset, it is this quadrant which gives you something tangible uh, that you can actually attempt to manage and to increase. To use this effectively as a knowledge management tool, we need to have an understanding of the pattern form. And all of you have an understanding of a pattern form. Uh, all of you have been using it to write the papers that you are presenting at this uh, conference. But there are some nuances that you may or may not you know, have paid a, a huge amount of attention to. The papers that I've read suggest that you probably are aware of all of these things, but uh, I will go over them briefly uh, in any case. A pattern begins with a name. The name is supposed to be evocative, not only of the essence of the pattern, but also evocative of its place in the larger context in which you are presenting the pattern. The, the pattern name should immediately cause a rush of memory when you encounter that name, and you remember all the details and all of the, the things that you read about in that pattern. So names are important. Uh, sometimes the names uh, of patterns can be very fanciful. So if you look at Alexander's padding line, pattern language, you will see patterns about dancing in the streets and sleeping in public. Um, these are fairly fanciful names, but they are very evocative of exactly what that pattern is about. And they bring back a lot of memory as a, as a result. A confidence level is something that uh, most of the patterns community that is not expressively emulated in their writings. Uh, but for Alexander, uh, when he presented his pattern line, with some of them he was absolutely positively certain were correct. Others he was less certain. And so he would give them or assign them a confidence level uh, in terms of number of stars. Uh, that's useful, uh, particularly when you're bringing a pattern to a workshop like this, uh, you are implicitly stating that this is a pattern that I'm pretty sure about, but I'm not absolutely confident that it's right because I want your feedback and your help to make sure the fact that it is right. So a confidence level could be a useful kind of a thing. The core of a pattern, of course, is the problem and the solution, and the two things should mirror each other. Uh, during our little demo uh, this morning, uh, Joe pointed that out, that uh, one of the critiques of the, the pattern that they were, were looking at is that the conclusion didn't sufficiently mirror the problem or all the aspects of the problem and all the forces. So, uh, you want to have this kind of congruencies, this kind of complementarity between the two things. When you provide context for your pattern, you are describing the stage play. You're telling us who the characters are, uh, you know, what props they're going to use, what the script is that they're generally going to follow. Uh, you are providing um, a lot of information that we can use in our imaginations to play out the pattern or to animate the pattern in our heads. 
the description, where the pattern was observed, why you think it is a pattern. Uh, these are important kinds of things because again, it helps direct the attention of the reader to an understanding of why you believe this pattern came into existence. As children, you may have lied uh, you know, laying on the ground and looked up at the sky and looked at the clouds and visualized that, well, this cloud looks like this and this cloud looks like that. And different children will have different perspectives about what is in that cloud, uh, depending upon their own background uh, and context. And this helps you, uh, the context and the pattern helps you resolve those kinds of differences. You can say, oh, that looks like a duck. See, here's its feet, here's its bill, here's its eye, here's its little tail feather. Uh, it, you can articulate those kinds of things as part of the context and makes it easy to understand what it is that you think you are seeing as the pattern. Uh, evidence is important. Uh, you need to be able to, I don't want to say argue for or argue on behalf of what it is that you believe you've discovered, but you do want to support it. You want to say, this isn't something that I sat down uh, and dreamt up last night. It is something that I actually saw and why I believe that this is, is the case. Examples uh, are always important in a pattern because they also provide you a range of variation in which you can find your own specific adaptation or your own specific application of the pattern. One of the, the things that my co-author and I have had go-arounds for, uh, Joshua Karashevsky believes very much that every <coughs> single pattern should have a core implementation section. And at the PLOP conference last year, he articulated uh, this kind of a fact. And so in our patterns paper that we're doing at this conference, uh, we included, at least sometimes, we included a core implementation section. My colleague thinks this is wrong, uh, that she sees no value in doing a core implementations. Um, but she's also thinking I'm very negative all the time because I get critical. Uh, so uh, it may or may not be something that you want to incorporate, but you can oftentimes learn as much from failure as you can from success. One of the definitions of an expert is somebody who has made all possible mistakes in the very narrow field of um, investigation, uh, which means that you make a lot of mistakes and become an expert mm -hmm. in something. Uh, the context for uh, how this pattern relates to, or how this pattern provides a context for other kinds of patterns uh, beneath it. The importance of this, again, is to build up this large tapestry you want to be able to weave your patterns together and form this kind of pattern language or this gestalt view of a patterned view of the world. The pattern form just introduced and the pattern form that most of you are following, the, the pattern form that most of the community is following, is that provided by Alexander in his pattern language book. So he laid out a format. There have been variations on that format over the years. There are at least three or four primary variations of what a pattern looks like, what, what sections must be there, what sections must not be there, uh, exactly what it looks like. But in general, we have been following the Alexandrian idea. With this slide, I just want to call your attention that there are other possibilities. Uh, one of the ones that you may be familiar with is uh, the, the concept or the notion of a kata, a way of doing things. Now, not being a member of Japanese culture, I do not know exactly how explicitly these kata are laid out, if they are a standard kind of form, but they clearly are articulations of pattern behavior. They are stories in one form or another, and probably a fairly standardized kind of a form that tell you what you should do and why you should do it in certain kinds of circumstances. Uh, if I was an aspiring pattern author uh, and from Japan, I would be exploring this, I believe, to see if in fact I could come up with 
a really innovative way of presenting patterns to have next year's Asian plot. Uh, it has captured my imagination. I would dearly love to do this, but I would need a Japanese co-author to, to hold my hand because uh, I, I kind of know where I want to go, but I don't know enough about the culture to do it well. Uh, the uh, other, let's see, is it on this one? Another thing to think about is the notion of kanji as a pattern. Now, I, I studied philosophy and Asian philosophy as an undergraduate, and so I was reading a lot about uh, kanji and how they came into existence and what they looked like and exactly why pictographic kinds of language or ideographic languages are different than syllabic languages, uh, like your kind of kanji. And one of, the, one of the things that I learned, or believe I learned, was the fact that uh, kanji are a very compact form of story. And in fact, it used to be the case that there were different schools of kanji writing. So you could have very subtle differences in the brush strokes. The character is exactly the same, but there is a su sufficient difference in the brush strokes that you could tell what school of philosophy a particular kanji was connected to. And in fact, you might even be able to trace it back to a particular poet who wrote a particular poem about a particular situation 500 years ago in Sichuan. Uh, and the Chinese civil service exam was actually based upon you being able to discover or know that. So for a long time, uh, in the 1800s, the, the civil service exam was based upon that. So. So you look at a character and you immediately are reminded of this whole story about what this character means, but what the composite characters within the character mean and why they are juxtaposed the way that they are and the story that is told about that. And um, from that again to the history of where the kanji in fact came from. So there's a lot of information potentially packaged in one very small, precise file. Um, did we mention mandalas in this? I don't think so. So one of the things that uh, we have been concerned about is that when you start to accumulate huge numbers of patterns, uh, keeping track of them and keeping track of their relationships among themselves is a very difficult kind of a task. Uh, it's one that the community faces right now. There are probably tens of thousands of patterns out there, uh, but they aren't all in the same place, and they certainly aren't organized in a way that makes them easily accessible. Uh, so you come up with this idea, you're supposed to uh, do research and find other people who may have written about this particular pattern, uh, and it's very difficult to do. So we have proposed doing uh, a kind of a visual representation uh, based upon a a style of Tibetan painting uh, with icons to represent these different kinds of patterns and the way they're connected. But you can do the exact same thing with kanji. And in fact, you have the foundation here for creating a literal pattern language. So it's just an idea. It's a, an interesting thing uh, to look at. But if you are going to actually take advantage of patterns as your tool, as your means of doing knowledge management, you need to look at your organization and you need to decide exactly how you would go about implementing this or doing this kind of an activity. So step one of that is to establish the actual infrastructure. You have your organization and you need to do something interesting with that. Uh, so the first thing you need is you need visibility and commitment. Just like everything else, you need to convince the people in your organization, and in the beginning, the people who lead your organization, that this is a worthwhile effort. So you have to have their commitment. And then you have to make it visible. It has to be some kind of a policy statement, uh, some kind of an overt act on the part of your leadership to say, yes, we are going to do patterns, and we are going to use it for this, and this is the way we believe it will help our organization obtain <coughs> Step two is that you need a patterns librarian. 
Uh, there, th this is uh, the most knowledgeable person about any kind of a subject is the research librarian in your university in charge of that collection. They are the people that you can go to when the, when the card catalog lets you down. You go and you're looking for a particular book and you're doing a Google search and you're doing a card catalog search and you aren't finding what you want. You can go to the research librarian who is a specialist in that topic and they know exactly where everything is because that's their business is to know this body of knowledge. They may not be a physicist, but they certainly know where all the physics bodies are, are located, you know, where all the, the stuff is uh, in that area. You need somebody of that capability. You need a patterns library. Obviously, you need to accumulate these things and put them in some kind of publicly shareable space. You need this visual evocative index, which is what I was suggesting uh, with the uh, the uh, visual image with icons representing patterns and a visual structure uh, representing that. And you need a reward system. And by reward system, I do not mean that you have to pay people to, to play with patterns. Uh, but you do need to create a situation whereby people that use patterns uh, to advance their work are given a sense of satisfaction or a sense of recognition that they did something good, that they did something right. Uh, to be a person that creates new patterns, again, you need recognition. You need some kind of um, psychological uh, reward for, for what it is that you are doing. And this needs to be institutionalized. Uh, it could be something as simple as a, you know, a, a dinner once a year where you acknowledge all the people who contributed to your patterns library last year uh, with no financial or monetary uh, reward placed off just the cycle I did. You need to establish a process. <clears throat> you need to know how and where and why to discover patterns and where to lead or train other people to discover patterns. So this is uh, it has different aspects to it. One is to start looking at all of the patterns that are already out there. It would be really, really helpful if Hillside would uh, get their collective uh, act together in regard to creating a single large-scale pattern repository. This is something that they've been talking about for a long time. Uh, it is something that has a lot of uh, potential difficulties like copyright issues, and you know, it's not a tr it's a non-trivial effort, but it is something that would be really critical and really supportive of the patterns community is to have a repository of patterns with a searchable index and uh, a way of helping people associate all of this stuff together. And there's a lot of valuable things out there that nobody is aware of. You need to attend plot conferences. Again, you need to be a part of a community. Patterns is a community movement and it is a way of sharing the tacit knowledge across that entire community. And as an individual organization, you need to be able to borrow from that community and you need to be able to contribute back to that community. It will probably be the case that occasionally you will have a pattern that is so valuable as a proprietary pattern that you don't really want to share it with anybody else. Uh, I suspect that's probably a long-term counterproductive attitude, but it, it may exist. But most of what you do in the patterns community should be shared with the community. You will gain from it. Then you need to instill this notion of observation and pattern mining. We have, in, our, in, in, the, in the patterns movement, we have two different kinds of perspectives on where to find patterns. Alexander was very interested in looking at the world out there and finding patterns in that world out there. We have other people in the community who are looking down here at their own work and trying to find patterns in what it is that they do uh, or what their team does. I would suggest that this kind of approach is less productive than trying to mine patterns from, from the world around you. 
another reason why you want to be in the community. You need to be aware of that world and where you can find and distill things from it. You need to encourage, actually, a culture of storytelling. Um, as dependent as we are on human beings, as human beings, on telling stories, unless you are lucky enough to be a creative writing student at some point in your life, you're never told how. Uh, nobody gives you good ideas or even heuristics <coughs> on how to tell a good story. And so we struggle with that uh, quite a bit. But your organization needs to have this as a, a kind of a process. And you need to be able to articulate the story before you try to write it down as a pattern. So you need to be able to tell people over coffee, your teammates, for instance, you know, I've been, I've been thinking, I've been looking at what we're, what we're doing, or I've been looking at what the industry at large has been, been doing, and I think I see something systematic here. You tell us a story, you share banter back and forth as a story, and if it um, survives that kind of a process, then you capture the pattern as a pattern. Uh, draft and edit it, do writer's workshops inside of your organization. So there should be you know, semi-weekly, monthly kinds of pattern workshop things where people are continuously bringing new ideas instead of setting through the workshop process. And maybe it takes three or four workshops before you have a pattern that you are ready to include in your patterns library, but you want to have that kind of a process in place. And then you need to constantly keep the library and the index of that library up to date and consistent. This can be a, or seem like, a fairly elaborate process. But we can subject it, or this process, to the same kinds of ideas that we subject our software development process to. And these are kinds of lean ideas or lean notions or ways of applying lean concepts to patterns and pattern management. So part of the lean concepts, and these, these are not all necessarily involving the process, but lean concepts that map into uh, doing things with patterns, uh, is recognizing that patterns are a way of eliminating the waste of reinventing the wheel. Uh, and they do so in a very economical manner, because again, they give you a template for a solution, they do not give you a solution. So it gives you the, the freedom to adapt to your particular circumstances, but it, you are not starting at ground zero every time you have to try to solve the problem. So having a, a uh, pattern library eliminates significant waste. Uh, it makes knowledge, tacit knowledge, explicit. Uh, it structures your communications because now you have the format of a pattern, whatever format it is that you adopt in your organization. You have the uh, foundations for creating a pattern language for a way to communicate about your business problems. Uh, you are solving things always in a, in a local kind of a context. Uh, and the last one is, one of the most important is that if you are going to have a good process and a lean process, your leaders, your organizational developers need to be writing patterns too. Your CEO needs to be writing a pattern about how to run a company, about how to specifically run this company because that pattern is going to provide a context for a lot of the other patterns that you may want to write about how to do sales in this company. So it, it provides a context. So you need this kind of uh, top-down notion, and these are all consistent with the lean management kinds of 